Morning, everyone. I invite you to come and have a seat if you're still milling around in the back and join us for this time of worship. If you're visiting with us today, we're excited you're here with us. If you're joining us online, welcome to you as well. Today, we're continuing our series on uh, the journeys of Jesus and Paul. Paul leading us in his journey uh, of faith with Jesus. And uh, the theme is light coming into the darkness. It was a dark place and it was uh, a place that uh, Jesus entered in and the light shone and people were set free from the, the binding of darkness in which they were, were living. So with that in mind, these words from Romans to lead us into worship. Where Paul writes, And do this, understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because salvation is nearer to us than it ever has been before. The night is nearly over. The day has come. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that you've called us here. We thank you for your spirit that brings us to this place. And wherever we're coming from, maybe we've had a great week, maybe we've had a challenging week, you bring us and call us to live in the light of your gospel, the light of your Son. Help us to experience your light today as we praise and worship, as we give of thanksgiving, as we commune together in the Lord's Supper, as we reflect on your word, as we interact with each other. May your spirit be at work among us, shedding your light and your truth in our hearts and our community. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and begin our worship out of need and out of custom.
receive God's greeting, grace to you and peace from God the Father, through Jesus Christ, his Son, and the fellowship and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The kids are welcome to kids' worship at this time. So kids, three-year-olds through grade six are welcome to join for our children's ministry. And I think, Sophia, you're going to be lighting the, or bringing the Holy Spirit candle down today. So why don't you come up and lead your group down to your kids' worship time. And let's, uh, in the meantime, mingle and greet each other and wish each other uh, the Lord's blessing.
that and we, 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 we sense, why don't you work towards peace? And that's our, our prayer. But um, they might say, well, Tony, it's not, it's, it's not that easy. It's more complicated working towards peace. And I, I'm the last one to claim worldly wisdom. I'm not sure about all the intricacies of being a world leader. Maybe you feel the same. And yet, that shouldn't stop us from praying. God is worldly wise. He does know the dynamics and the complications of working towards peace. And so we pray to him and uh, ask him to intervene in mysterious ways and maybe even logical or commonsensical ways. James says the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And so let us pray with that uh, conviction. Our Father, to whom the world belongs, we know you are wise beyond words. And you are loving in ways that take our breath away. You are gracious and kind. You are just and true. We pray that you would pour out your compassion on our world. Administer your holy justice, we pray. In places where there's injustice, where there's violation of human rights, exploitation of, of life, of children, where there's hunger and famine and sword, we pray for all of these places and people in our world and lift them up before you. We pray, O oh Lord, that your grace would intervene, your justice would continue to work its way through the many structures and channels that exist in our world. We pray, O oh Lord, that the prisoner would indeed go free, that the hungry would be fed, that the sick would be healed, the lonely would be visited, and the lost would be found. That is our prayer. We pray as we give ourselves to your way, that the kingdom would come through us and the good news of the gospel would be proclaimed through our hearts and our voices, through our hands and through our deeds. Answer our prayers, we pray, O oh God, a God who knows the hearts of men and women, who knows the ways of the world. Hear us, we pray, that your kingdom might come and your glory might be revealed and your shalom might come to the earth. Help our hearts to be in tune with yours, that our lives would live out your will in this place. We pray for our church family. We thank you, Lord, that there will be opportunity this week to remember Lisa's brother, Ken, as we remember him and celebrate his life. We pray your spirit to be upon us. We pray for Kathy's brother and the cancer that he has. Lord, we pray for your ministry upon him. Be with Kathy and Tom as they seek to support him. We give you thanks for a new birth for O.G. and Lota, for the gift of life in a son, Toby. We thank you for the health that he is experiencing and the, the wellness that Lota has uh, been experiencing as well. We pray for those who are homebound, those who are lonely or frustrated or living with chronic pain. We pray for them. Bless us as we reach out to them, visit with them or connect with them in the many opportunities we have to do so. May our words and our gestures be used of you to bring, to bring comfort and to bring strength. We pray for those who are looking for work, who are unemployed, who have gifts and skills and experience but can't find a place to use them. Help them not to be discouraged and we pray for open doors in your provision. We thank you, Lord, for the good health that many of us experience for the food that you give to us, for the homes that we have, for the jobs that we uh, are, are engaged in and productive in. We thank you for all of those provisions. We thank you. Help us to live lives of thanksgiving, of gratitude. And as we give of the offering today, we pray that that would be 
an indication of our, our grateful hearts. We pray for the ministry of our church as we continue to seek to be a, a body that ministers to each other and to this community of St. Albert and beyond. And we pray for the Mustard Seed Church that we will uh, reflect on today in our offering and we will give to today. We thank you for the staff and for the volunteers that are uh, leading that ministry, serving in that place in downtown Edmonton, for the many patrons that come, for those who are experiencing homelessness or food insecurity, for those who are struggling with uh, addictions and those who are uh, living with, uh, with heavy burdens. We pray for them. And we pray that you can continue to bless the work of our hands and our hearts to help help them. Receive our offering today, O oh Lord, and use it uh, for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This time we will receive the offering, and um, as we prayed, it's for our budget, for the ministry of our church, and the second offering is for the Mustard Seed Church in downtown Edmonton. Let us uh, worship God with our gifts.
As an order, we uh, continue our series on the journeys of Jesus and Paul. And uh, just coincidentally, or providentially, we might say, the women's Bible study are studying the book of Philippians, which we've been looking at the last few days today, uh, uh, last few Sundays today as well. Uh, what happens in Philippi and the church that was formed out of those events uh, eventually resulted in the book of Philippians, and that is the study of uh, the women's Bible study at, uh, at this time. So there's some interesting conversations going on uh, about that. Uh, today, uh, if we look at our first slide, um, we'll just review a map of uh, where uh, Paul is traveling with Silas and, and Luke. Uh, and I didn't bring my laser pointer today. I forgot at home, so sorry about that. But if you remember last week, uh, Paul and Silas and his companions were going to head north to Bithynia, which is up towards uh, Byzantium there. You see Byzantium near the top by the Black Sea. And he was heading up that way, and it said there that the Holy Spirit, or the Spirit of Jesus, actually stopped him from, uh, fr stopped them from going to, uh, up, up to Bithynium or up further north. We don't know what that looked like, whether it was a border guard or whether a bridge was washed out. We don't know what it was that actually stopped them from going, but they interpreted it as the Holy Spirit saying, we're not to go there. So they went to Troas to regroup a little bit, and uh, Troas is, is right, uh, to, well, you can see it there above Sardis, and um, that's, that's where they wait, and there Paul receives a vision uh, of a man from Macedonia. Now, Macedonia is above uh, present-day Greece. So if you look at present Athens there, yes, thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Rajash. Okay, so there's Athens, that's Greece, and above that is Macedonia. And is, can you point out Troas while you're at it? There, see it there? Right there, yes, thank you. They're in Troas, they get a vision of, of a, uh, a man that says, come and help us in Macedonia. So Paul thinks, well, that means we need to go to Macedonia. They see that as a vision from the Lord. And so they go and head up towards Macedonia. They get on a ship, right, exactly. They get on a ship and they go to Neapolis. They land there in Neapolis, uh, a bit to the right. No, 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 yep, right, yeah, to the right, up top there. Yes, Neapolis. And they travel about the 10 kilometers to Philippi. And there are the events that are, that are happening here. You make a great team, Rajash. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, and then the next slide is a few pictures of uh, present-day Philippi. Uh, and it's not a city anymore. Uh, Neapolis is, actually. It's a thriving port town. But uh, 10 miles in, inland towards Philippi, there's, there's uh, just ruins there. Um, and on the right... There's pillars there, and they actually are the remen remnants of the, the church that was formed there. So uh, Lydia and we will see the jailer today form uh, part of the New Testament Philippian church. And that grows, and eventually they, they build a cathedral there. Now all that's left are a, a few pillars, but you can see the foundations uh, of the, what used to be a, a large church in Philippi. And then to the left is just a, a, a sort of a wide-angle shot of the ruins of the city. And uh, there are, um, you, you can, we will see more of these as time goes on, but there are compartments. You see, this was a, a house or this was a, a, a marketplace. And in every uh, town, every city, there was what was called the marketplace or the agora. It was called the agora, or it was like the city square. And there, people would gather and do their business. Uh, um, later on, we'll talk about Paul being a leather worker. He, for a, a long time, he actually would go to a city, stay there a year, a year and a half, and he would do his leather work, or he's a tent maker. They call it actually more a leather worker, making tents or making other leather goods to support himself as he ministered to the church there. We noticed last week there's a pattern that happens when Paul and Silas and, and, and Luke and Timothy, they go to a town, or sometimes it's just two of them, 
uh, they go to the synagogue or they go to some place and they preach the gospel. They, they tell the good news that Jesus is the chosen ones. Jesus is the, the Messiah expected by the Jewish people. And then uh, the, something inevitably happens. They engage in, in, in conversations with people. Someone gets upset. They start stirring up the crowd and uh, they end up being in trouble. They end up running for their lives or uh, escaping from the city or, or being told to leave. Uh, and that's a, a pattern and no different uh, in Philippi. And today we are going to look at the, the final episode recorded by, by Luke in the city of Philippi. And it's uh, the story of uh, the jailer. So uh, Paul and Silas are uh, getting into trouble and they are... Uh, they are taken and they are, they are, they are beaten up and uh, then they are put in prison in, in Philippi. And uh, we're going to read what happens there uh, while they're in prison. So starting at verse 25 of Acts chapter 16. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and he was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before, before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. And at that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately, he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. So Paul is making waves again in Philippi, Paul and Silas, and the uh, event that caused them to be thrown into prison is recorded in the earlier part of uh, Acts chapter 16. So just very briefly, there is a, uh, a girl there, she's a slave girl, and she's being used by her slave owners, exploited really. She has a spirit in her uh, that can tell the future. And so they are using her uh, to uh, make money to get people for, for, uh, who want their fortune told. He would, they would, she would tell them their fortune, he would, they would receive money. And, and she was, it was a form of trafficking in a way, of exploitation. Well, she starts to follow Paul and Silas as they're preaching and she, she's shouting about them and shouting to them and it says Paul is very grieved or he's annoyed it says but actually a better word is he's grieved, he's sad at what's happening. He sees the exploitation, he sees the abuse, he feels for this young, young girl and so he casts the demon out and of course the, uh, the, the men who are using her lose their source of income so they become quite upset and the accusation they make against him is, is not that, uh, that they've taken away our source of money because they know there's something wrong about that. So they say they're causing turmoil. And if there's one thing the Roman Empire did not like, it was turmoil. Societal unrest. That was throughout the New Testament. When that happens, the Jewish authorities are nervous because they think Rome will take away their privileges if they can't keep control of their population. And so the charge that comes against Paul and Silas is that they are troublemakers, rabble-rousers, they're stirring up the people and they're creating chaos and unrest in society. And so they're taken and they're beaten and they're, they're put in prison. And we see Paul doing this uh, everywhere he goes. And if we look at the next slide, we will see how this works. So this is a, uh, it's called a bima, which is a, the Greek word for a, a raised platform. And every agora or every marketplace had a raised platform. 
And the purpose of that was, as you would guess, is people would stand there and give speeches. They would talk. And so Paul uh, may have been standing on this platform. This is actually the one in Corinth. We don't, the, the one in, in Philippi is, is no longer there. It's, the foundation is there, but the act, this is, gives a better picture of, of what uh, a, a bema or a platform would look like. And so they would stand there. He would stand there and he would engage the population. He would engage the crowd. And um, when I talk about the gospel and public discourse, what Paul is doing is he's engaging in, in public life. And so the gospel is something, as we watch Paul and his journey, that affects every sphere of life. You can imagine the people standing there listening to him, everyone from slaves to free people, uh, to soldiers or centurions, to people engaged in market, merchants, people, civil, civil servants, people who were working in politics, who were on the, the city council, all sorts of people mingled in this open public square. And Paul engaged them all as he, as he brought the message and uh, we, we, saw him, we saw him do this with the, the woman uh, that was being exploited. So he's engaging in, really, in social justice, right? He's engaging in economics, even, uh, as he affects their bottom line by the gospel he's preaching. People see, my bottom line is affected here, my, my income and it gets them upset because the gospel has intervened and spoken into that sphere of their life. In a few weeks, we're going to look at Paul going to Athens. Now, Athens was, if I can, uh, you might say, the intellectual center of the Western world. That's where the philosophers gathered and asked about the meaning of life and what it, how do we understand life and how do we live in response to that. And uh, Paul engaged in these... Uh, these academic discussions with them uh, because he knew that the gospel had something to say to that sphere of life. And so whether it's economics or social justice or whether it's, it's intellectual or academic, uh, whether it's legislative, uh, whether it has to do with uh, education or whether it has to, has to do with the marketplace and commerce, the gospel has something to say to all of those spheres. And what's interesting is the dynamic uh, between what the gospel says as its heart and its implications for the rest of society. And so the gospel at heart is our, our hearts being transformed, our relationship with God, be reconciled to God. That's the heart of the gospel. It's very relational. It's very emotional. It's very personal. It's immediate. That's the heart of the gospel, as we will see with the, the jailer. But the implications of that are like a ripple effect. It, it goes into the rest of our lives and the rest of our society. And we will see that happening throughout Paul's, uh, Paul's journeys. And so they are in prison, and while they are in prison there, in the dark, uh, they've been beaten up. Uh, they're suffering because they get open lacerations on their backs and their feet are in stocks and they're uh, in, in the dark. So in the next slide, it's a picture of a prison, that uh, prison of St. Paul. And so there's an arrow that points to that and there is, it'll lead you down a path to this place. Now actually, they all say that this is probably not the actual prison. So, uh, but it was something like it. It's, uh, it's open now, but it was, it was covered, of course, before. So it was in the dark, it was underground, and uh, that's what a, a prison would look like. And so they are, they are in this prison, in the dark, and it, uh, uh, Luke tells us it's, it's midnight. So it's dark and damp, they're probably hungry, uh, they feel uh, alone. And what are they doing? Well, they're praying. I guess we can expect that. We would probably be praying in those circumstances. But they're also singing. And we might say, I, I don't know if I would be singing in those circumstances. But Paul and Silas are singing. 
And then it says there, the rest of the prisoners are listening to them. So if you can just recreate in your mind what, what, this, is, what this might be like. It's, it's dark, you can't see anyone, it's pitch black, it's cold, it's midnight, people are tired but they can't sleep. And they hear singing. What was the song they were singing? We don't know for sure, but we imagine they were probably psalms. For example, Psalm 40. If I can just quote part of that. So remember, this is a song. The psalms were written to be sung. We, I think we often forget that because we don't have the music for them, but they were written to be sung. So this Psalm 40 says, for the director of music, a psalm of David. Perhaps Paul and Silas were singing this. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on a rock. He gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. I'd like to show you a little clip from a movie. It's a Shawshank Redemption, 1994. Tim Robbins and um, Morgan Freeman are the two main characters. And some of the, the, the context here is this is about a, a, this is a prison movie. They're in prison. It's a, it's a dark place. There's people living there with, with guilt. There's corruption. There's violence, abuse. It's, uh, it's not a nice place to live. And uh, one of the characters... Uh, has access to, uh, he started a library and he started receiving boxes of books. And in one of these boxes, there was actually uh, a, a record player and albums. And so he plays it and just hear what, uh, what happens to this community of, of darkness as they, they listen. And there's a, Morgan Freeman gives a voiceover to help us interpret what is happening. not singing Figaro by Mozart, <laughs> they're singing hymns about their God who will come and rescue them in, in the darkness. And maybe when we are in our times of darkness, I'm not sure, I know I, my first impulse is probably to pray but not to sing, but maybe singing would also be an appropriate response. Lord, I lift your name on high. I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. Imagine singing that when we're struggling and believing it, giving him praise, giving him thanks for his salvation. Or maybe if you're more attuned to hymns, abide with me fast, falls the eventide, when darkness deepens, Lord, with me abide. When trouble comes and helpers flee, help of the helpless, or oh, abide with me. They're singing, 
And while they're singing, it seems God answers their prayers. And there's an earthquake. And uh, we've seen earthquakes in this area of the world. Uh, they're, they're, they're devastating. And buildings just fall on top of each other like a pile of pancakes. And so it happened to this prison. The walls were shaken. All the doors were flung open. People were uh, set free from their chains. And the jailer thinks this is it for him. His, his life is over because if you were in charge of prisoners and they escaped, usually you ended up being executed yourself. And so he thinks it's over. He draws his sword and he's about to kill himself. And Paul says something amazing. I don't know if we can even imagine this is, this is, you know, is this true? He says to them, don't be afraid. Don't kill yourself. Everyone is still here. Why would Paul do that? Well, because Paul, I'm, I'm thinking has a goal in mind. And it's not to escape, it's not to take the opportunity and set himself free from this horrible situation. No, it's an opportunity here to further the gospel, to give God glory, to bring another soul into the, the kingdom of God. And so he says, don't be afraid. Nobody's escaped. Don't kill yourself. And the jailer asks for light, and light intervenes and comes into that space, and uh, they, they see him on his knees there, and he asks, what shall I do to be saved? And we actually aren't sure what he understood as salvation there. Did he, did he mean it the way we often think of it in spiritual terms, or was he just thinking, what should I do to not be executed? What should I do to not face the sword or the execu execu executioner's sword? Is it physical salvation he's looking at or is it spiritual? We, we don't know, but no matter to Paul, he just zeroes in on the question and he gives the answer that he thinks needs to be spoken right now. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Not even sure the the jailer is asking a spiritual question, but he says, believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. He takes it as a spiritual question and he gives the answer. He responds with his answer, believe in the Lord and you'll be saved. And the spirit was at work and he came to salvation. Now is the day of salvation. This whole scenario, this is event that happens uh, sort of reminds me of Paul saying in Corinthians, now is the day of salvation. Today, it's sort of, the, there's a sense of urgency. They're, they're in prison, they're in the dark, the walls are shaken, light comes in, and it's, it's now, now is the time to receive salvation. There's a sense of urgency here where Paul says in Corinthians, Today is the day of salvation. Now is the day to be saved. And he's thinking of Isaiah, the prophecy of Isaiah in that passage in 2 Corinthians 6. Isaiah said, he said, a time of my favor will come, of God's favor, and uh, it'll be a day of salvation. And Jesus comes, provides that salvation by his death and resurrection. He brings in the kingdom of God, the kingdom of salvation, and Paul says, now we are living in that era. So it's not just a matter of, at this point, we need to make a decision. How can I be saved? Well, believe in the Lord Jesus. Make that decision, as important as that is. Paul is saying something more comprehensive. He's saying, this era in which we live is the era of light. We've just experienced Easter. We've just celebrated the resurrection of Jesus. We are now living in the light Death and its shackles has been removed. We live in the life and the light of Easter Sunday. We are living in this time. And I think Paul is saying to the Corinthians, he's saying, don't let this moment pass you. Don't receive this grace in vain, he says in that passage in Corinthians. Today is the time of God's favor. Today, now is the day of salvation. And I think he's saying Act responsibly in light of that new reality. Act responsibly in light of the fact that we are now living in the light, being taken out of darkness 
in this now day of salvation. Live it now. And uh, I think often, speak for myself, maybe you can relate too, if you've grown up in the church, if you've grown up in a Christian family and have been part of the church your whole life, we, we, we know the call to love each other, we know the call to care for each other, to seek justice and mercy, and uh, it just becomes something that is part of our, our sort of under the, the surface of our lives. It's always there, and it's, it sometimes gets, gets muted and loses its sense of urgency. And I think Paul is saying to the Corinthians, he says to the Philippians, he's saying to us, today we are living now in the light of the era of salvation. Let's be urgent about how we act. Let's love each other. Let's care for each other. Be kind to each other in urgent ways, in cutting edge ways, in radical ways, because we are now living in the light. Just like this prison door, these doors were broken open, and now they suddenly find themselves blinking in the light, the light of the gospel, the light of truth, set free from the chains of guilt, and now they live in the freedom of gospel light. How are we to live now in such light, Paul is asking. Now is the day of salvation. Let us, our actions, be so radical that people can't but tell we live in the light of a gospel like no other, a holy light. And so just as we finish, I'd like to sort of circle back to how that has implications for every sphere of life. I hope all of us can say that Jesus lives in our hearts, that I have a personal relationship with him, that he's my savior as the one who died for my sins and that he's the one I want to serve as my Lord. And my prayer is that always remains vital and strong and vibrant in our hearts, at the heart of who we are, this new relationship that we have with God through Jesus. But then we ask ourselves, how do we now live in the light of that truth? And like Paul, he, he in, interfaced with every aspect of society. So I would just like to highlight two as we conclude this morning. One is the whole area of labor. How does the gospel, the fact that I live in the era of salvation now, affect my work? The job that I have, whether I'm a homemaker or a construction worker or a business owner or a lawyer or a teacher or a nurse or a doctor or a pastor or a carpenter or a garbage collector, a recycler. How does the gospel affect me? Paul, as I said earlier, was a leather worker. And he uh, often worked while he ministered to pay for his own ways. And he saw his own hands-on work as part of his ministry, part of his living out the gospel. In fact, at the end of the book of uh, Corinthians, Corinthians 15, he, after this glorious visionary uh, section on the resurrection, he says, now... Now that we know we are living the light of Jesus' resurrection, my dear brothers and sisters, he writes, stand firm, let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the Lord as if you were working not for yourself, not for other people, not for your boss, but give yourself as if you were working for the Lord. Colossians, he says the same. Yeah, you're working, you're answering to a manager, but really... Your ultimate manager is, is the Lord. That's who you're working for. And so God gives us skills and gifts and knowledge and experience that we can use in very manual ways. He gives us a sense of purpose in our careers. That when we get up and go to work each day, we feel a purpose. We feel fulfillment. We feel we are contributing to society or we're doing much more than just earning a paycheck, paying bills. We're actually engaging in ministry. And ultimately, when our heart is transformed with the gospel, we go to work each day and we say, 
Lord, this is my act of worship. May the work of my hands and my heart and my, my, my voice and my relationships give you glory. May you be worshipped as I offer them to you each day. And the second sphere is that of education. Paul went to Athens, as I noted earlier. He engaged in the intellectuals of the day, the philosophers, the, the ones who were asking the deep questions about life, and he wades right in there, and he says, uh, you, you know, I noticed that you are talking about these things, and he will look at that in a few weeks. He engages them and starts speaking to them in their sphere of influence. In their case, it was the educational sphere. Teachers can tell you better, better than I about Christian teachers, about how to take our faith and transform it and translate it into the classroom. We, we come with certain biblically informed assumptions, unprovable assumptions that God created the world. He made it beautiful, that it's tarnished by a brokenness, by sin. And that he's in love with that world and he's recreating it, he's redeeming it and making it new. And all the research we do, all the learning we do, all the lectures we listen to, the books we read, the studying and exams that we write, the papers and essays that we submit, the teaching and the conversations we have about learning and growing and about our world and creation and our faith, they're all, they're all part of the ongoing work of the kingdom, the coming of a new heaven and a new earth. Anticipation, increasing our knowledge and our faith of what God is doing among us through education. I love the way this story ends. The jailer believes and he says he, he takes them home and he washes their wounds. And then he's baptized. Sort of ground zero there. Right at the uh, back to the basics. Paul has just experienced uh, a reform in the penal system. And now he's, he's in the house of a jailer. He's baptizing them as he has received cleansing of his wounds. And at the heart of it is this radical new relationship the jailer has with Jesus. And now he acts in compassion and mercy and they have fellowship together. They share a meal together. And it says there, he was filled with joy. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you call us to live in relationship with you. Out of our brokenness, out of our darkness, you call us to the light. You call us to wholeness. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you that now is the day of salvation. And that in that era of Easter light, we can live. And as we find ourselves reconciled to you, living out the implications, the radical implications of that faith, of that gospel, cause us to be faithful in every sphere of life that you call us each day, in our homes, in our families, in our places of work or our schools, in our churches. May we be living out the light of your truth. In Jesus we pray. Amen. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's love? Let's uh, stand together and sing in response.
Please be seated. As we approach the table, I'd like to read a, a description of the New Testament church. So this wasn't the church in Philippi or in Athens or Thessaloniki, but it was the church in Jerusalem, as described by Luke in Acts 2. Uh, but it was, it gives us an impression of what the church was like across Asia Minor and uh, into Europe. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs that were being performed by the apostles. And all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the New Testament church, for the way they shared together their belongings and their needs, whether they, and they, the way they, they taught together and had fellowship together, whether they broke, as they broke bread together. Uh, we thank you that many years later, we can say we experience the same as we care for each other as we break bread together, as we teach one another, as we encourage each other, uh, we give you thanks that we, in a sense, can be the New Testament church many centuries later, at least experiencing the same fellowship, the same spirit, the same word, the same experience of communion with you. Bless us as we share bread and juice together, that we share the body and the blood of Jesus together. Encourage us in our walk that, Lord, we would receive this sacrament as blessing, as a token again of your love and your call upon us to live in your light and your truth. And as we share it together, may your spirit uh, of generosity infiltrate this place that we would be built up and encouraged in our faith and in our Christian walk, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. On the night Jesus was betrayed, in the upper room he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. Do this to remember me. And after supper, Jesus took the cup of thanksgiving and he gave it to them and he said, this is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it to remember me. And so we celebrate, we share in the bread and the cup in faithfulness to God's command, to Jesus' instructions, and we do it to remember him and to celebrate his salvation and his fellowship with us. If you're visiting with us, uh, we believe you may participate if you confess Jesus as your Savior and trust him for the forgiveness of your sins and seek to follow him as his disciple. We're uh, going to come to the front, uh, if I can ask Peter, our serving elder, to come forward and uh, just come from the beginning, from the first to the, from the, the front of the sanctuary to the back, uh, come forward and then return to your seat, please, with the bread and the juice, and then we will celebrate uh, the meal together.
blood of Jesus given for you. Marguerite, the blood of Jesus given for you. Joel, the blood of Jesus given for you. Randy, the blood of Jesus given for you. Aaron, the blood of Jesus given for you. And Joanna, the blood of Jesus given for you. Again, the blood of Jesus given for you. All the blood of Jesus given for you. Nigga, the blood of Christ given for you. Sharing the blood of Jesus given for you. Sharing the blood of Christ given for you.
blood of Jesus given for you. Miriam, the blood of Jesus shed for you. Adele, the blood of Jesus given for you. Simone, the blood of Jesus given for you. For Josh, the blood of Jesus given for you. Lucy, the blood of Jesus given for you. Take the piece of bread, eat it, remember and believe with all your heart that Jesus gave his body on the cross for the complete forgiveness of all of our sins. And take the cup, believing with all your heart that Jesus shed his blood on the cross for the complete forgiveness of all of our sins. Let's pray together. Loving God, you graciously feed us with the bread of life and the cup of eternal salvation. May we who have received this sacrament be strengthened in your service. We who have sung your praises, may we tell of your glory and truth. We who have seen the greatness of your love, may we see, your, your, you, see you face to face in your kingdom. For you have made us your own people. You are God and we are your people. You've done so through the death and the resurrection of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who is our Lord, and by giving to us the life-giving power of the Holy Spirit. Bless us, Lord, as we go out from this time together, nourished and strengthened, encouraged to live out the gospel in this day of salvation. Amen. Let's stand together and sing what we confess, uh, what we believe.
the parting words from Paul's letter to the Thessalonians. Rejoice always and pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for us in Jesus Christ. Do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them. Hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. And may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. And may your Holy Spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord is faithful, and he will accomplish it. Amen.